Hey everybody, Dr. B here. This is my module 15 lecture video. It's the last video of the semester as far as these uh, lecture videos that I'm making this summer. And well, let's see, before we go any further, I'll show you my t-shirt of the day. May the force be with you. You might think that's a Star Wars shirt, but it's a uh, obviously a Newton's Law shirt, right? Or it's a final exam uh, cheerleader shirt so, because I really want you all to do well on the final exam. So may the force be with you. Uh, but in any case, you can see behind me the Arnal volcano in Costa Rica. This is from 2006 when it was quite active. And uh, my family and I are going to be there in a few short weeks. Hope that you all have some good adventures planned. I know some of you have been taking your fun adventures while the course has been going on, uh, which is one of the exciting things about an asynchronous online course. Let's see. So without further ado, let's dive into the PowerPoint file. Here you can see a picture of a fire tornado. Uh, and I've actually had some experience with fire tornadoes, um, both at the University of Maryland, where the fire protection engineering um, department has a cool fire tornado demonstrator, which I highly recommend if you ever get the chance to go on a tour there. Uh, they have a cool open house. Uh, the whole campus has an open house every uh, spring, end of April on a Saturday. It's called Maryland Day. Uh, highly recommend you check that out, both the Maryland Day as a whole and the uh, fire tornado in particular. So I've actually created a fire tornado demonstration that we've done at AACC uh, for various events really fun to to do obviously something you have to be careful with but fun uh intro to our unit on heat and temperature thermal energy all right so some things to know module 15 real quick small packet small homework small lab um, none of those are optional um, you skip any of them you get a zero the one that's going to hurt you the most though is the lab so definitely don't skip that one there's no quiz for module 15 Basically, I just want you to get the uh, material and then start getting ready for the final exam. So there is a uh, module 16 review quiz. So take advantage of that. You get multiple attempts. You get feedback. It's a multiple choice format. You get feedback. It, it helps to start get you thinking about topics that maybe you haven't thought about for a little while. Other things you can do to prepare for the final exam. Uh, use your module 16 resources. Use prior quizzes. Um, the, we used to have unit exams. Sorry, I forgot to take that out of there. Instead of having unit exams, now we just have quizzes. Um, it, it makes it a lot less rushed in the summer uh, by not having three exams in addition to everything else that we already had in the course. Uh, so much uh, nicer format for you all um, now that we've changed that over. Anyway, uh, look at your note packet, your homework problems, and do the problems, okay? Even though you did these problems previously, looking back at how you did them before is not going to help you nearly as much as if you redo them, okay? Take your paper out, look at it. Look, I'm sorry, don't look at it. Cover it up, cover up your solution. Just look at the problem and redo the problem without looking at how you did it before. And then check yourself. Um, if you didn't have a, a good solution for it or if you don't have an answer that you know is right, um, then just let me know. I'm happy to check your work for you, check your answer, whatever it is, um, so that you can do a good job preparing for the exam. Do the problems. All right, and then ask me if you have any questions at all about anything. All right, here are the learning objectives. Those are listed in the uh, module 15 overview page. Now let's get to it. Temperature. Temperature is a measure of the energy per particle, okay? Average kinetic energy. That's different than thermal energy, which is the total amount of energy in all the particles in the substance. We'll give an example later to help you understand the difference between those two. All right, the equations for converting from one temperature unit to another are listed on your equation sheet. Go ahead and find them. Know where they are. Basically, it's just plugging in, doing a little algebra. Sometimes you don't even have to do algebra depending on what conversion you're doing. Notice or not notice, but let's talk about the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales. They have different size increments. So let me explain. Water uh, has a freezing point of zero degrees Celsius. Okay, that's what somebody decided we would call uh, zero Celsius. So 
At the point at which water transitions from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, they decide to call that zero. And then 100 for the transition from gas to liquid or liquid to gas. So there's 100 increments on the Celsius scale between those two points. Between those same two points, uh, the Fahrenheit scale goes from 32 to 212. So there's 180 increments. So there's a lot more increments to get the same kind of distance um, on those two temperature scales. So a Celsius scale is definitely bigger okay, uh, than a Fahrenheit uh, degree. Okay, One Celsius degree is bigger than one Fahrenheit degree because it takes 180 of these to go up the same amount that 100 of these Celsius units can go up. All right. Uh, Celsius and Kelvin, on the other hand, have the same size increments. So why do we have them if they have the same size increments? Well, as I said, somebody decided that we would call zero Celsius uh, the point at which water transitions from uh, liquid to solid or solid to liquid. But that's not the coldest possible temperature. We know that it can get colder than that. Even in Maryland, okay, we can go below zero Celsius or below 32 Fahrenheit. Doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. How much colder can it get? Well, people did experiments where they did a graph and they looked at uh, pressure versus temperature. And they took the, the measurements of pressure and temperature for a whole bunch of points of gas samples. They cooled, cooled it off, heated it up, took the pressure reading, and then they looked and they saw this linear trend, and then they extrapolated it back until the pressure was zero. Okay, Because when the pressure is zero, that means the molecules are not moving anymore. So now they no longer have any kinetic energy. And if they don't have any kinetic energy, their temperature is zero. Okay, the average energy would be zero. So that would be the, the absolute zero, not just a zero that we define arbitrarily. Turns out that was 273.15 degrees Celsius lower than the zero on the Celsius scale. So absolute zero is minus 273.15 Celsius. And they said, well, let's make that zero on our Kelvin scale. But then they made the increments the same size. So one, one, Increment Celsius, same as one increment Kelvin. All right, and you can see the conversion uh, between Celsius and Kelvin. There's no multiplying factor. It's just adding or subtracting 273.15. All right, now, if this were an in-person class or a synchronous class, I'd have you uh, grabbing some objects from in the room, putting your hands on them, and telling me what they feel like. So I left this in here. This is from the last time I taught this course in synchronous online format. And so here's some of the things that people grabbed. Um, I, um, I crossed out a couple just because I didn't think they were as good at illustrating the point, uh, but a snow globe, they were touching the glass part of it, felt a little cold. A stapler touching the metal part, it felt very cold, according to my student, um, which is what most people think when they touch uh, metal. Um, somebody touched some cotton on their pillow, felt a little warm. So why is this? What's going on? Are these objects actually different temperatures? Probably not, because all of these objects are things that have probably been in their rooms, whatever, wherever they were uh, sitting at the time, they've probably been in there for a long time, and they've probably come to thermal equilibrium with the room, okay? And since most people keep their house at about the same temperature, they're, they're probably all the same temperature. Or let's let's put it this way. Let's say you went and found something that was wood or plastic in your room and you found something that was metal. They're going to be at the same temperature unless you just brought one in from outside or you've heated one of them somehow, but probably not the case. So they're both the same temperature because they both achieve thermal equilibrium with the room. Why does one feel colder than the other then? Okay, so if I grab a piece of metal, grab a piece of wood, one feels colder than the other. It's not the object that's one object that's colder than the other object. It's one hand is colder than my other hand. Okay, grab a piece of metal, energy transfers from my hand into the metal quickly because it has a high thermal conductivity. Grab a piece of wood, energy travels from my hand into the wood slowly because it has a low thermal conductivity. Okay, so what then, what message is getting to my brain? Well, this hand is transferring energy really quickly into the metal. So this hand has cooled down considerably. This hand is sending energy 
from my hand into the wood slowly. So this hand really hasn't cooled down very much. So from here, I'm getting kind of a like, yeah, it's kind of just not much to report, just kind of feels like not, you know, regular. This one feels cold because this hand has cooled off considerably. So it's your hand temperature that you're sensing, not the object temperature. And in fact, when we're able to measure these, when we're in person and we can use a thermometer to measure them, like an infrared thermometer, the piece of metal, after the person has held both objects, the piece of metal is actually warmer because you've transferred more energy into that object. And so it's kind of funny to measure them after people have held them and told me for sure that the metal is colder than the wood. And it turns out the, uh, the metal is actually warmer at that point. All right. Okay. And that property, thermal conductivity, that's how fast the energy gets transferred in or out of the material. On the other hand, specific heat capacity has to do with how much uh, energy transfers in or out of the substance. And so if you're heating something up, what would be, what would be the things that would determine how much energy it's going to take? Well, those uh, three things would be how much of the material you have, which we could use mass to represent how much of the material you have. The other one would be, how much do you want to heat it up? And that we could look at as delta T. In other words, what's the initial temperature of the substance and what do we want its final temperature to be? Remember delta T or delta anything is final minus initial. So delta T would be final temperature minus initial temperature. So that's important for us to know. And then the other one is the specific heat capacity. That's something that depends on the material itself. Some materials have a higher specific heat capacity than others. And we can see that in our OpenStax textbook. I think it's table 14.2 or 14, maybe it's 14.1. Anyway, you'll see that in there. All right, let's look on the equation sheet to see how those three things are represented. All right, so Q is amount of energy and that's measured in joules or calories or kilojoules or therms, but the SI unit would be the joule and that's equal to M C delta T and forgive the crazy wacky lines that my computer somehow likes to put on there. Q equals MC delta T. Mass is in kilograms, delta T is in degrees Celsius or in Kelvin. And then specific heat capacity is in joules per kilogram per Kelvin or joules per kilogram per degree C. Okay, at least for SI units. Right. And doesn't matter if you're on degrees per degree C or per Kelvin or, or right here. If you if you put your final temperature and initial temperature, doesn't matter if they're in Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, doesn't matter if they're in Celsius or Kelvin, as long as they're both in the same uh, scale. Because if you subtract the two temperatures, if they're both in Kelvin or you subtract the two temperatures, they're both in Celsius, you're going to get the same answer because it's the same size unit. Go ahead and try it. Um, however, if you're doing T, as opposed to delta T, then it definitely matters. So like PV equals NRT, ideal gas law, it absolutely matters if you have it in Celsius or Kelvin. Well, Kelvin, by the way, for ideal gas law. All right, so just to uh, summarize what we were just talking about, specific heat capacity has to do with how much energy, whereas thermal conductivity has to do with how fast the energy moves in or out of the substance. And we're not gonna do any calculations for uh, thermal conductivity, um, but we will do calculations involving specific heat capacity, both in the packet and in the lab. All right, so if you pour a cup of coffee, and then you forget about it for 30 minutes, does it still have the same amount of thermal energy as when you poured it? Definitely not, because some of that thermal energy has gone into the air, some of it's gone into the table, and then who knows where it goes after that. So it does not have the same amount of thermal energy. So is thermal energy conserved? Well, I don't know. I don't even think that's the best example for us to decide. How about if I rub my hands together, rub them really hard together, I feel them warming up. Well, now I have more thermal energy than I did before because I've converted some mechanical energy, me rubbing my hands together into thermal energy. So thermal energy can be created. Well, not really created, but you can take another kind of energy and turn it into thermal energy or vice versa. You can take thermal energy and turn it into mechanical energy like in your car engine, okay, if you have a traditional internal combustion engine. Um, but what if we're not having any, any 
energy transformations taking place, okay? So number one, no energy transformations taking place is then thermal energy conserved. Well, as you could see from this coffee cup example, uh, seems like no, or maybe we're just not able to keep track of it. So for us to be able to keep track of it, we have to define a system. And to really make this easy, we, we think about an isolated system. So if we can isolate the system, then we'll be able to say, oh, well, the amount of thermal energy should be the same. So if we have uh, some space where we can section it off, especially if it's really well insulated, think about a Yeti cooler or, or you know, whatever brand of that style of cooler, those super insulated coolers, or, or an insulated coffee mug, one of those nice vacuum insulated coffee mugs. There's not much energy transfer happening. It happens very, very slowly. And it happens so slowly that for most things that we're doing that just take place over a series of a couple of minutes or even less, we can say it's an isolated system. So imagine inside one of those coolers, if we had you know two cups of water or a cup of coffee and some cream and we pour one into the other, the amount of thermal energy should be constant, okay? Okay, so imagine with the cooler closed and we had some bars that went in there that allowed us to pour um, one thing into another. The amount of thermal energy in the cooler should be the same the whole time. It doesn't matter if we mix things together, that's not changing the thermal energy, okay? And I'm ta not talking about any chemical reactions either, okay? Remember, no energy transformations. And you can have energy transformations when you have a chemical reaction, but that's, that's a different course, right? Okay, so no chemical reactions, no energy transformations of any kind, and we have an isolated system, well, then we can say, oh, well, the amount of thermal energy is conserved for that system at this time, okay? So it's limited. It's not really a law of conservation of thermal energy. It's just that we can, we can say the, thermal energy, the amount of thermal energy is constant under certain conditions. All right, well, I mentioned, what if you're adding some, some milk or creamer to your coffee? Does the cup still have the same amount of thermal energy? I think most people will say no. I've, well, I've asked this question lots of times. So I know generally most people say no. Then I ask, does the coffee, does the cup of coffee have more or less energy now? Usually about two thirds of people say it has less energy. And about one third of the people are right. And they say it has more energy because the cup of coffee had energy, the milk had energy, and you put them together. Now there's more energy in the cup of coffee than there was before because you've just put more energy into it. Okay, the temperature goes down, which is why people get this one wrong, but the amount of energy goes up. Remember, the milk was not at zero Kelvin. Okay, it was not at minus 273 Celsius. Okay, I don't know what temperature you store your milk at. I don't know how, what temperature you have your, your refrigerator set to, but I guarantee it does not have a absolute zero setting on your refrigerator or even on your freezer. Okay, so it has some energy because the particles in there are moving. Okay, so even though when you add it to the coffee, it cools down the coffee, there's still more thermal energy than there was before. Okay, noodle, noodle that through. And if you can get that, then you really understand the difference between temperature and thermal energy. Okay, temperature is the average energy per particle. Thermal energy is the total amount of energy of all the particles. One half mp squared for this particle, one half mv squared for this particle, and this one, and this one, and this one. So when you poured the milk in there, you're doing the one half mv squared for every single coffee particle. Okay, and that's going to be a little lower because they've slowed down a little bit, but you're also including the one half mv squared for every single milk particle. And the total of all that's going to be more than it was before you added the milk. All right, now we're going to switch over. I'm not going to pause. I'm going to do this live because on take one of this video, I paused and I lost everything. And that's the second time today I've lost everything. I don't want to have that happen again. So forgive me as I do this transition right here live. There we go. So here is the question. This one is not one from your packet. Okay, but it is something that's going to help you in terms of doing the lab. Okay, and it's also related to this idea of looking at the, the, the amount of thermal energy in, a, in an isolated system being constant. All right, so you've got 240 grams of coffee. Oops, slide this over. Oops. 
140 grams of coffee, 90 degrees C, and we've got a spoon, and it's 25 grams, 20 degrees C spoon. Uh, the coffee, we're going to approximate it as being water because it's 99% water and the spoon is steel. Okay, this is my picture of before or initial. My picture of after There we go. We've put the spoon into the coffee. We've stirred a little bit. Now we have 240 grams of water. We have 25 grams of steel. Okay, remember the coffee is 99.9% water. And the T final is, well, we don't know, but it's going to be somewhere between 20 and 90 degrees C. So that's my after or final state. Okay, so a nice little diagram. Help me keep track of what's going on. Okay, kind of like momentum, the diagrams that you were doing in module 11. All right, so what happens? Well, we're gonna have a Q for the coffee and that's going to be a negative value. Okay, because the coffee is going to cool down. And we're gonna have a Q for the steel or the spoon and that's gonna be a positive value the spoon's going to heat up. So how much energy is the coffee losing compared to how much energy the steel or the spoon is gaining? Well, the final temperature, it's going to be around, I don't know, 80 something degrees, I would think, because the spoon's not going to cool it down that much. So you might think, oh, the spoon is going to change, have you, the cue of the spoon is going to be bigger than the cue of the coffee. But that's not true. If we treat this as an isolated system, and not because it's super well insulated, but we could be using a, you know, one of those Yeti style insulated, vacuum insulated uh, cups. But even if we're not, if we're doing it over like 30 seconds or 20 seconds, there's really not much time for energy to be lost. And so with that approximation, okay, for an isolated system, Q of the coffee plus Q of the steel spoon is going to equal zero. They're going to be equal in size. And subtract the steel spoon, the Q of the steel spoon from both sides. And you can see this is equal to the same size as this. It's just there's a minus sign in there. Okay, because one's positive, one's negative. So in other words, if this is negative 20 joules, then this is gonna be positive 20 joules. Okay, the temperature change is not gonna be the same for both of them, but the energy change is gonna be the same size for both of them, okay? It's like if you're in a room with Bill Gates, okay, and he hands you a million dollars, he's a million dollars poorer, you're a million dollars richer, Okay, like the amount that he lost is the same amount that you gained. Okay, same kind of deal here with these Q values, the heat transfer. Also, the million dollars is not going to affect Bill Gates nearly as much as it affects you. I mean, unless you're as rich as Bill Gates. Um, okay, so it's going to have more of an effect on you. And that's like here, the Q whatever the Q value is, like I said, maybe it's 20 joules. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, 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 a example. It's probably not that, but the 20 joules is going to affect the steel spoon. It's gonna affect its temperature more than losing 20 joules will affect the coffee's temperature. Okay, just like the million dollars is gonna affect you more than it's gonna affect Bill Gates. All right, so now let's get into doing some calculations with this. So we can say M of the coffee, times C of the coffee times delta T of the coffee equals minus M of the steel, C of the steel, delta T of the steel. And then we can start putting some values in there, 240 grams times, uh, let's see, specific heat capacity. We have to look this up. Okay, remember for water, or, I'm sorry, for coffee, we're going to treat it as if it's water. 
and we're going to go into our textbook. And I'm just doing this on my screen. I know you can't see it, but I'm looking up the specific heat capacity for water and water has a specific heat capacity of 4,186 joules per kilogram per degree C. Delta T be T final minus 90 degrees C. That was the initial temperature of the coffee. And then we are going to multiply by one kilogram per thousand grams. Okay, that is to take care of this gram and that kilogram, although you'll see it doesn't actually matter. 25 grams times specific heat capacity for the steel spoon. Look it up, it's 452 um, joules per kilogram per degree C times final temperature. I'm sorry, I'm off the page a little bit there. Now you can see that. Um, T final for the spoon minus 20 degrees C for the spoon. Okay, now notice I just called these both T final because they're gonna reach thermal equilibrium and the final temperature of the coffee is gonna be the same as the final temperature of the spoon, okay? Because they're reaching thermal equilibrium. And again, the reason that this is the same size as this is because it's happening in an isolated system. And again, that's gonna happen just because we're doing it so quickly. Uh, thermal equilibrium is achieved within seconds, you know, maybe 30 seconds, but probably faster than that. All right, now we have an equation. We have one equation and one unknown. Now it does appear twice, which makes it a little bit more interesting, um, but good news is we can solve it. Uh, we do have the problem. This is in grams, that's in kilograms. So let's fix that. One kilogram per 1,000 grams. And actually what we can do is we can multiply both sides by 1,000. And then oddly enough, we can just get rid of this and this. 1,000 over 1,000 is one. 1,000 over 1,000 is one. So there's only one term on the left side and one term on the right side. There's, there's not this plus this plus this. So we just need to do it to this glob of stuff and we'll multiply this glob of stuff by 1,000 as well. And so those cancel out. Here's where it gets, you know, we just kind of have to slog through the math. 240 grams times 4,186 times T and 240 times 4186 times negative 90. So just a matter of doing the math now, 240 times 4186 is 100640, and that's joule grams per kilogram degree C times TF. And then we multiply that by negative 90 as well. And we get 9041760. And this is joule grams per kilogram, where the degree C have canceled out. Equals, okay, so here's this number multiplied by TF. Here's this number not multiplied by TF. And then we have negative 25 times 452. And that gives us negative 11,300 gram joules per kilogram degree C times TF. And then we have a negative sign and a negative sign. So this one's gonna be plus, we multiply that by 20, and we get 226,000. And this is gram joules per kilogram, which is really weird, but that's just because we got rid of the factor of a thousand. Um, and then, now it's a little bit simpler. Now we can combine the TF terms. So we're gonna add 11,300 TF to both sides. So we go back 1004640 plus 11,300. So I get 101595940 grams per kilogram degree C TF equals, we've got this giant number. I'm gonna add that to the 226. 9041760 plus 226,000, and we get 
9064-3600 joule grams per kilogram, really weird unit. But now we're gonna divide by 101.5940 grams per kilogram degree C. And I'm just gonna put it there so it applies to both sides. Do that on my calculator. Divide by 101.5940. And get the final temperature. Let's put it over here. Final temperature of 89.2 degrees Celsius. So you can see we had a uh, joule gram per kilogram and we had, oh, I lost my, lost my joule there. So we had joule gram per kilogram degree C. All right, so we're dividing joule gram per kilogram by joule gram per kilogram per degree C. So this ends up having a final unit of degree Celsius. And this makes sense. Our spoon, putting our spoon in there does not cool down our coffee very much. Okay, that's the main point there um, as far as thinking about, is this a uh, reasonable size answer? I think it is because I've done this before. I put a spoon into coffee. It does not cool it down tremendously. Um, so that makes sense. Um, the other thing to look at here is that, yeah, the math's a little annoying, but it's really not that hard. Um, once you get the units situated, if you wanted to say, hey, unit break, you write right on there, unit break, and then you're like, I'm doing the algebra. Okay, you've already checked to make sure the units make sense. You do the algebra without the units, it, it actually is a little bit um, cleaner, so to speak, in terms of doing the math part, making sure you don't make any mistakes. All right, similar example is very, very similar. The only difference is instead of putting a 25 gram spoon, now we're putting 20, five grams of milk. And we're gonna approximate milk is also being water because milk is 99 point something percent water. Um, and so we're gonna see, is, is it gonna come out to also be about 89.2 degrees Celsius or is it gonna be different? So, well, we can use, I'm not gonna rewrite all of this. Um, it would be basically the same diagram, except that we would be putting milk here and we'd be putting milk in there. And then the other difference comes in right here. Instead of specific heat capacity for steel, we're going to use specific heat capacity for milk, or really we're going to just approximate it as being water. Um, and you can look it up. You can find it. It's a, milk is a little bit different specific heat capacity than water. Um, I don't think that one's in your book, but you can find it out there on the interweb. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy that down. And actually, I'm just going to, I know the left side is staying the same. So I am, I am taking advantage of the fact that I just did this same problem, except for those different, that one difference that I talked about. So that's the left side of the equation equals negative 25 grams times, now I have 4186 joules per kilogram per degree C times T F minus 20 degrees C. So the right side, left side stays the same. Okay, right side becomes negative 25 times 4186. Now this is negative one zero four six five zero. So that's quite a bit bigger than before because the specific heat capacity for water is almost 10 times bigger than that of steel. And this has units of joule grams per kilogram degree C. And then minus sign, the minus sign, we're going to get a plus. So let's plug that by 20 and we get plus two zero nine three. Zero, zero, zero. This has units of joule grams per kilogram. Degree C over degree C cancels out. All right. And then I'm just going to do the algebra uh, quickly for you. Uh, this video is getting kind of long. So I just want to go ahead and get you to a resolution here. So one, zero, zero, four, 
six four zero plus one oh four six five zero. Actually, I'm just going to do it all in one step in my calculator so we can get this wrapped up. So just bear with me. So T final comes out to 83.4 degrees C. And so that's a lot different. You might not think it's that much different, but it is actually a lot different, in my opinion, than the 89.2. Here, the delta T was 0 0.8 degrees, technically negative, 0 0.8 degrees C. So it only went down by a little less than a degree. Here, the delta T is negative. 6.6 .6 degrees C. So this, uh, in this case, the coffee went down by over eight times as much in temperature as it went down in this example. And that's a big difference. And that's entirely due to the difference in the specific heat capacity of the milk versus the spoon. Okay. And so this does two things. One, with this example, I showed you how to do the math on it and not to be freaked out by it, that you can get through it. But also, it illustrates how specific heat capacity of the material, and it's different for each and every material, um, how that impacts the behavior of it. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, and you'll get to see that more in the lab as well. Okay, so conservation of thermal energy? No, but we can, we can say that the amount of energy in a system is conserved if it's an isolated system, okay? And we can do that if it's a short enough time period or if and or if the insulation is sufficient, okay? And this matches what we calculated. And what it says is compare the loss of energy by the coffee to the gain of energy by the steel spoon. So we could actually go back and calculate Q of the coffee and calculate Q of the spoon. We already have the equations for those as we wrote out right here, but now we actually know what TF is. So now we could, we could look at that. So we can do 240 times 4186 times parentheses 89.2 minus 90. And then we're gonna divide by a thousand. So that's negative. 803.7 joules. And then we're going to do the same calculation over here. This is my Q spoon. So it's 25 grams times 452 times parentheses 89.2 minus 20. So much bigger delta T divide by 1000. And we get Hold on. Twenty-five. Well, this is strange. All right, why did that not come out closer? That was negative seven eighty-two, or not negative seven hundred eighty-two joules. So that doesn't quite match. All right, this. This bugs me. All right, I'm gonna to have to make a follow-up video because uh, I don't want you to have to watch while I track this down. All right, so that's a terrible way to end this video. That was gonna be my grand finale to show that it came out the same either way. All right, so my apologies, um, but just look for the next video and I will uh, have worked it out there. As always, ask me if you have any questions.